Anyway, anyway so, so we go we from story to story, 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 and we don't have the context, context of what it is, is you know, that's, that's happening. happening. So, so it says they went up on a mountain, said he went up on a high mountain. mountain. You know, I wonder how high. I mean, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't say. I guess we have to look at a topographical map to see how high all these mountains that it talks about in the Gospels, you know, are. You know, are most of them, um, you know, a thousand feet, 500 feet. Um, you know, if you, anywhere in Havasu, if you're going away from the lake, you know, you're elevating, you know, and um, I know from my house, I live right above Jamaica, off McCulloch, um, and then going up to McCulloch at the top, it's a 200 foot elevation because I have an altimeter when I walk. No, but it's a 200 foot climb. You know, well, so, so that, that would be like, like so, so Gene, Gene took his disciples from Jamaica to McCulloch on this high mountain. mountain. Maybe that's a high mountain. mountain. I don't know what I'm walking at this. <laughs> but, you know, maybe that's a high mountain. Maybe it's a thousand feet. I, I have no, you know, I have no idea. But this one specified a high mountain. So, and the funny thing is, we don't know which mountain this is. You know, <laughs> all the other ones we kind of... We, we kind, kind of, of know. So as we look on there, you know, you know you've got, got um, Mount Moriah, and that, that was, was the mountain where um, Isaac was sacrificed, or was going to be sacrificed. It's where David built an altar to God. It's where Solomon built his temple. Okay? Um, so you can see that's a pretty, pretty good place. You know, that's why they always say that if they go to rebuild the third temple, they can't do it because what's on Mount Moriah right now? The Dome of the Rock. You know, the um, um, Islamic, um, you know, temple. I got So, you know, because people don't realize, because you see the Western Wall, you know, where the Jews go up and they pray and they put their prayers in the cracks and they bow and all that. And people think, think, well, that's, that's the, the edge, edge of the, the temple. temple. So all you got to do is build where the one, and then next door is um, is the Dome of the Rock. But that's not the case. The Wailing Wall, the Western Wall there, was a wall around the temple. You know, so they'd have to blow up, you know, the Dome of the Rock. Of course, you read the news right now. Maybe they're getting close to doing that. I don't know. You know, it's getting pretty rough over there. But anyway, but those are the kinds of things that happened up on uh, Mount Moriah. But the thing is, is you got to remember this one particular mountain. All these things are happening. You know, Isaac's you know Isaac's sacrifice, uh, David's altar, Solomon's temple. Um, you know, it's there. Uh, you've got uh, what's the next one? What's the next one we've got there? How, how do I, oh, I got it in my hand? Like that. So Mount Horeb in Sinai. What do we know about Sinai? Also called Mount Horeb. What's on your list there? Burning bush. You know, that, that's a big deal. You know, that's when Moses is up on Mount Sinai and a voice comes out of the, you know, comes out of the burning bush. So that's a big um you know, that's a big deal. The giving of the covenant was up at Mount Sinai, you know, where God spoke to, you know, where God spoke to Moses. Um, let's see. We saw several theophanies. A theophany is an appearance of God, okay, on Mount, uh, on Mount Horeb. Uh, to Moses, to Israel, to Elijah, um, and also given on Sinai were the, um, you know, the patterns to lay out the temple. You know, because the temple, whether it be the tabernacle back then, Solomon's temple, the way that it was built, was supposed to be, you know, a blueprint of what heaven is. Okay? And then you've got um, Mount Hor, H-O-R, that's, That's where Aaron, Aaron died. Aaron, you know, went up to, you know, it went up, 
undressed all the vestments from Aaron and he died and they revested his sons. And that was on Mount, um, on Mount Hor. Mount Gerizim and Ebal, um, blessings and curses of the covenant were recited. You know, if you read Deuteronomy 27 and I think 28, you know, God tells the people, remember, they're getting ready to go in the land. This is the end of Deuteronomy. He's restating the laws of covenants, and he goes through a chapter of, if you do this, here's your blessings. Whole chapter. You need to read it. And then the next chapter, he goes, I, I may get it backwards, which one comes first. But the next one is the curses. You don't do this. You get these curses. But anyway, but that took place up on Mount Gerizim. Mount Nemo? Nemo. Nemo was a fish, wasn't he? <laughs> um, at Mount uh, Nebo, uh, Moses sees the promised land. Remember, they're not in the land. And God tells Moses, you're not going in the land. I know, I know you've had these 40 years of traveling with this bunch of complainers like Pastor was talking about. You know, you know today, today about, about you know complaining about, about what they had to eat and what they didn't they have, have to eat. And so I know you put up with them for forty years, but because, but because of your sin, sin because of your unfaithfulness, unfaithfulness, you know, which because he struck the rock and all that, that. you don't you get to go into the promised land. land. But I'm going to take you up on the mountain, and you can see the promised land. Goes up on the mountain, sees the promised land, dies. Okay, I guess that's a consolation prize. Like that. But we're going to see Moses here on the Mount of Transfiguration, you know, which is, and then Mount Zion, you know, and Mount Zion is Jerusalem, you know, it's the chosen city of God, and it's a foreshadow of the church. Like that. So whenever you see Mount Zion, you know, we talked about this in Master's Men about a month ago, you know, about Mount Sinai being where the law was delivered. You don't want to be on Mount Sinai because that's all the bad news. I mean, here's the law. If you don't do it, I'm going to kill you. And then you have Mount Calvary. And that's where Jesus died on the cross. You know? And all the things that we couldn't do from the law of Mount Sinai, Jesus paid for it. And then Mount Zion is like the new Jerusalem. Mount Zion is like heaven. Mount Zion today is the church on earth. Right. right. You know, there's a theory that Mount Calvary and Mount Moriah are basically the same thing. Have you, have you ever ran across that? It, it, it's like, you know, it's, in, it's Mount Moriah might be like a Rocky Mountain. You got well, here, but it's you, you know, it could be, it, it, you know, it doesn't matter. I mean, each mountain isn't the something. Each mountain is what it represents. And this is the, this is the thing with so much of the scripture is to see what it represents. So God uses that for what it represents. Here's the important, here's the important thing is that is that all the stuff that we're going to see in the transfiguration is mentioned in the Old Testament. It's, it's not like, you know, Jesus says, come along, I'm going to show you a whole new thing. Okay, He takes them up there, and, we, you know, we read through it, but we'll go through it. He, he takes them up there, and while they're seeing the things happen, they're relating back. They go, oh, oh, yeah, I guess so. You know, like that, because they understood the Hebrew Bible better than they understood the things that Jesus was saying. You know, because they were always walking away from what Jesus said, scratching their, you know, scratching their head. You know, saying, "What's he saying?" And, you know, I mean, even to the point where in, we saw two weeks ago when we were doing Matthew sixteen, where Jesus is talking all this stuff, and then when he says. You know, but I'm off to Jerusalem and I'm going to die. And Peter, understanding that fully, said, oh, that will never happen. You know, because Peter didn't understand 
what the Old Testament prophecies meant. He probably understood what the Old Testament prophecies meant, meant, but he never related them to Jesus. You know, so anyway. So let's, let's go on. So that was um, so the high mountain. See, but the main thing is that mountains mountains mean something. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. So transfigured, the word itself means change. Okay, I mean it's not like it's a magical word. When we see the words in the Bible, we'll see. When we see the words in the Bible. We think that they're holy words or they're special words. And really, they're just words that maybe we don't use today. You know, I mean, I, you know, I, I don't know. You know, something, something was changed. I mean, what, what a, a cocoon changes. A cocoon is transfigured into. What is it? A butterfly. I don't remember. I don't know my grandkids here. I don't remember this stuff. Anyway, so but we could say that they were transfigured, but we don't say. We say they were changed, you know, they became or you know, whatever it is. So what do you think what do you think this is describing when it says he was transfigured and his face shone like the sun and his clothes became white as light? Huh? Well, well something, something special, special is happening, happening to him. him. Now, now, see, see Moses, at, at one, one time, time when he was in the presence of God, God turned into like, like a, his face turned into like a light bulb. bulb. You know, he had this radiance, this glow about him. In fact, when it started to wear off, he wore a veil. Not so much so people wouldn't see the glow, but that they wouldn't see the glow was fading. You know, so here we have Jesus, and the best way I heard it described, you know, was that um, his divinity was leaking out of him. <laughs> you know, it was, I've asked this before, because I use it for this. Anybody remember the movie Cocoon? Uh, remember the movie Cocoon? And so, and what happened, you know, so you got these people, and they were, you know, they came to outer space in those pods, and then they, you know, became, they came out of the pods, and there were people in that. But what happened when they unzipped their people suit? Anybody remember? Huh? No, they were, no, they were just a glow of light. Oh, no, yeah. The, you know, he's in the pool with one girl, you know, and she unzips for him. <laughs> and just a glow of light. And then once they... they get, these were old people like us. Back in the day, they weren't. We weren't like them. But they were old people. But you know, now we're like them. But um, but anyway, when they get in the pool, they take off their their people suits, and they're just like just shooting all over the place. And that's pretty much what Jesus is. He's just that he's got this people suit. Well, it's not a people suit. That's a heresy. <laughs> Do that. Yeah, but anyway, but, but I'm, I'm, within, within that, that, he's got this glow of God, God, you know, that's in him. So, so I don't think that, I don't, I don't think that, I think that because we're going to see the presence of the Father there, is that that makes him glow, you know, it's not like, but anyway, but that's, what, that's what's happening. Uh, now, the thing is, is, um, you know, was this at night? You know, that's, that's, that's the, the thing, because it's going to say, um, uh, well, well, one of the others, you have to, to get the whole story. It's in Luke 9, and it's in Mark 9 also, okay, along with, you know, this here. So you pick up little pieces, because it says when they got on the mountain, it says that the disciples were asleep, you know. And so there's a good chance that really this was happening at night, that they got up there. And then that's why that glow was so big, because it was that, you know, it was that night. So it says, and Peter said to G, or, and behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Okay? So I'm um, so sitting around talking. How'd you feel on that conversation? You know? Like, what are they? Now, I think in Luke, yeah, in Luke, 
it says that they were talking about his exodus. Jesus' exodus. What does exodus mean? Departure. You know, it's, it, they're sort of talking about his departure. Remember, he said, I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm going to be killed. You know, I'm going to uh, die. I'm going to uh, raise from the dead. And we know about his ascension, you know, 40 days later. So they're talking about his about his um, uh, departure. Because in Luke it says, two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor talking with Jesus. They spoke about his departure, which he was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. Um, so we got that. In verse 4, it says, And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good that we are here. If you wish, I will make three tents here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Yeah. Um, what do you think Peter's talking about? Yeah. Pardon? Well, you know, he wants to build tents. I mean, regular... Regular tents or housing, uh, you know, we'd, we'd make them like those mini houses up on the collar, you know. <laughs> but um, no, he's talking about, you know, that again, this is foretelling about, or this is after the foretelling, because we'll see that in Exodus um, about the temple. You know, and I'm, Peter's got it wrong. We're going to say, hey, <laughs> and there you go. You know, and you know, we all, you know, and, you know, and this is the thing, you know, because people will say, when I get to heaven, I'm going to tell God. You're not going to tell him, you're not going to tell him anything. You're going to fall on your face just like everybody else in scripture does when they come in the presence of, of God. But you know, there's, um, you know, there's a Jewish holiday called the Feast of Booths, called, called Sukkah, you know, yeah. where they go out and build tents, they build sheds or whatever it is, you know, they build uh, outdoor housing and they go live in it for a week because it's it's commanded in the, in the scriptures, we'll see. And I got to thinking about it, you know, is that this... Um, you know, Sukkoth is. Let me see if I wrote that down. Yeah, it's in. Um, it's in. It's one of the fall feasts. It's, it's in October. Uh, so this is in the spring that this is happening there. So it's not for Sukkoth, but those kind of things that Peter has in his mind. But then I was thinking about the Jewish holidays. You know, anybody know what's coming up? Thursday, the second, whatever day is the second. Huh? Mm -hmm. Nobody, you wear party hats, blue horns, and stuff like that. Rosh Hashanah, Jewish New Year. Yeah. So I, was, so I was thinking about it. I go, you know what? Because after this, we're taking a break from the life of Christ. And I said, in January, we'll pick up at the crucifixion. I figured, why don't we do a class on the Jewish holidays? Your Jewish holidays are a big deal. Um, if for no other reason that they're in Scripture. <laughs> and they're commanded by the voice of God. If you, re if you read Leviticus 23, the whole chapter is God saying, these are the holy days, and this is how you will observe them. You know, And the Jews, to this day, still observe all of those, you know, observe all of those you know, feast days and festivals, and uh, you know. Now the funny thing is, Rosh Hashanah is not one of them. You know, uh, there, there's a mention about the New Year, the first day of Nisan, or no, not Nisan. Anyway, it's the first day, and uh, we talked about Rosh Hashanah. I think a little bit. Well, we talked about the Jewish calendar. I want to talk next week. Talk about the Jewish calendar, how it's laid out, and why. You know, because, because whenever Thursday or Wednesday, whatever the second is, the New Year, it's going to be 5785. 
in the Jewish, you know, way that they, like, who would have ever thought 5785 would finally get here, you know? But here it's coming up, you know, um, this week, because they go back and they measure from, where do they measure from? Not, Not creation. creation. Yeah, see, see, everybody, everybody thinks, thinks it's creation. creation. Probably most Jews think it's creation. But it's not creation. It's the creation of Adam and Eve. So it's six days short of, um, you know, of creation. So, but what I, I don't want to get off this. But what we'll do is we'll find Jesus in all these holidays. All those holidays are to foreshadow Jesus. You know, in John 5, Jesus said, all these things are about me. You know? So when he says all these things, it's when we read it, we ought to be looking for looking for Jesus. Okay, so. Yeah, yeah. So he said that he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as light. But... By the time he gets down to the mountain, all of that has dissipated because it's not his face is shining in front of the other. Right, because, of, because he felt that they're not, not to say anything. Yeah, yeah, no, it's it's for that occasion. You know, yeah, it's, it's for yeah, it's for excuse me, it's for that occasion. And obviously, he doesn't. This goes back to what we talked about before. It's not the time for the people to know this. He's revealing this to his three witnesses. You know, we're going to see that um, that in uh, Exodus, when Moses goes up on the mount, he takes a witness with him. Joshua goes with him. You know, who who has the same name as Joshua? Jesus. Yeah, you know, it's the same Hebrew name. You know, yeah. but he but takes a witness. Most people don't realize it. They think Moses is up there by himself. You know, yeah. but in um, but in Exodus twenty four, I think it is. I, I have it in my notes. Maybe you have it in your notes. I don't remember. But um, you know, it says Moses arose in the morning, and Joshua went with him. You know, so. Um, and anyway, but that way back to what you're saying is that yeah, it wasn't the time for the people to know. And that's why he even tells these disciples, don't say anything. Mum's the word. You know, not until after um, whatever he said, until after the resurrection. Or, um, Peter said that Peter kept a secret until almost to death. Right. Well, no, Peter had to have revealed because he gave the sermon at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. But he, but he didn't, didn't do, do it, it before, before that. that. Yeah. yeah. No, because no, no, I, 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 trust me, you, you know, know the, the, the resurrection, resurrection was so big. Remember, you got all these guys who had scattered, scattered, had denied Christ, you know, did whatever, you know, did whatever they did. And here we're talking, uh, how long was Jesus on earth? 40 days after the resurrection, before the ascension, and in Acts 1. I think in verse 8, he ascends into heaven, and then you get in right away into chapter 2, and Peter and whoever else is there in Jerusalem are out preaching Christ and his death and resurrection. Like that. And then you got, in Acts chapter 6, you got Stephen. Even while he's being stoned for being a witness to Christ, is still preaching to them. And when Stephen does the preaching to them, he just doesn't just say, this Christ who you killed um, and has been raised from the dead, that was Peter's message. He's, he takes them all the way back into the Old Testament and said, look, I want to show you who this guy is, not just tell you what he did. And he goes, well, do it. He recites all Old Testament you know, history back you know, back to them. So, did that answer that, Ray? I mean, if you find where you saw that, you can, you know, call me and let me know. Um, so it says, he was still speaking when, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. 
So we've heard that kind of talk before, you know? Um, you know, Peter was still talking, you know, about building the tents, you know, when all of a sudden this voice comes, you know, comes out. And who's he talking to? He's talking to the, the, the voice out of the cloud. He's talking to the disciples. You know, listen to me. This is my son, you know? So um, it's a bright cloud. In, in the Old Testament, you know, God's presence is the cloud. You know, uh, the the uh, the cloud in the Old Testament was was actually Mount Sinai on wheels. You know, because no, because once once the, uh, Moses them came down and they read the law to the people, and then they built the uh, tabernacle, the instructions that were given. You know, you know, by, by God, God, and then they moved they out. out. They moved they away from Mount, Mount Sinai, and the, and the cloud, the cloud traveled, traveled with them. them. You know, yeah. I mean, throughout, throughout the whole 40, 40 years, years, the cloud traveled, traveled with them. So it's so like Mount Sinai on the wheels, wheels, you know, you going know, across the um, desert. desert. Um, God, God was with his people in the, in the cloud and the pillar of fire, you know, at night. Uh, let's see. In whom I'm well pleased, you know, why is God pleased? Because Jesus is going to do Good Friday. You know, if you don't know this, Good Friday is the culminating event in redemptive history. You know, everybody wants to say that the resurrection is, but the resurrection is only the testimony to what happened on Good Friday. Jesus died for the sins of the world. Yeah. And it's always the same message. Listen, you know, listen to him. And it says in verse 6, And when the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were terrified. Uh, the disciples had no trouble identifying who was doing the talking. They knew it was God the Father. Okay. But like I said earlier, they fell on their faces, and that's what we would all do. You know? He used to say that... Um, I read a lot of presidential biographies, and almost all presidents will say the same thing, is that people come to meet with me, and they've got this list of things they're going to tell me, tell me off. It goes until they step into the Oval Office, and then they just become, you know, mild-mannered, and there's just something about the presence, you know, that you know, when we're by ourselves and all bold until we come into the presence of authority. Yeah, so. so it says when the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were terrified. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Rise and have no fear. And that's always the second half to the falling on their faces, is that Jesus says, Fear not. Again, and that's what the presence of Jesus is supposed to mean to all of us. Is that if we know that we have Jesus, we shouldn't have anxiety. We shouldn't fear. And the times that we do have anxiety and we do fear is when we've lost contact with the fact that we have Jesus in our life. Yeah. Any questions? Okay. And when they lifted their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. So now when they looked up, Moses and Elijah were gone. Okay. okay. Why were Moses and Elijah gone? What did what did Moses and Elijah represent? Pardon? Well, no. That, well, they were two that didn't die in the right. Well, Moses died, but it, obviously he never. You know, well, nobody knows where he was buried or where he was. Elijah ascended into heaven. Um, you know, without dying. But it's generally considered the law and the prophets, that they were the main characters of the Old Testament. Okay? And, and people don't like to hear this, but he's saying the Old Testament's gone. You know? The Old Covenant is gone. Yeah? The, the, all, and, and, and the, all the laws are gone. Okay? And um, now that doesn't mean that they don't get mentioned in the New Testament, 
like that. But if we read the Old Testament, we should, this is my opinion, okay, I'm just, uh, I, I endorse this message, <laughs> my message, <laughs> is that if we read the Old Testament, we should be reading it as history and from where the church came, like that. And, and not for the laws or to read about this mean God who did all of these. It's just, we just accept that's the way God ran history up to that point. Okay. Jesus makes a new covenant, you know, and then we go by the law of Jesus, you know, and how did they sum up the two all the laws, says in the scripture, you know. Love God and love your neighbors as yourself. And it says that summarizes the whole law. See, if you love God, you're not going to do all those blasphemous things, you know, that it says that people do against God. And if you love your neighbor, you're not going to murder your neighbor. You're not going to steal from your neighbor. You're not going to take your neighbor's wife. Um, you're not going to covet his goods. You're not going to steal his property. What am I missing? Uh, money, whatever, whatever, whatever it is, is you're not going to do those things if you have those two, you know, if you have those two, uh, two laws. Any questions about that? You can have questions. You can even object. I may never talk to you again, but no. <laughs> okay. So it says, um, uh, okay. So they saw no one uh, except for Jesus um, only. And uh, it says, verse 9, and as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus commanded them, tell no one the vision until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. Um, what do you think they thought about that comment? I mean, they thought, do we see any um, reason to think that they believed that there was going to be a resurrection? He said, don't, don't tell them until the resurrection. resurrection. But when it came time for there to be a resurrection, none of them believed. You know? Like that. And so, I mean, if anything, they would, it would seem like they would remember and say, I don't know what he was talking about, the resurrection thing, because I don't see no resurrection. Who must have really been feeding us the line? You know? So, um, so it says, uh, Let's see, and they're coming out of the Son of Man raised from the dead. Uh, because he says, until the Son of Man. You know, and that until is in Matthew 28, when we, uh, when we see the resurrection. And the disciples asked him, then why did the scribes say that first Elijah must come? Like that. And it does say that. Malachi, I think, the last book of the, you know, last book of the Bible. Like that. Um, we see, we're going to see that this is about John the, you know, John the Baptist. And he answered, Elijah does come, and he will restore all things. But I tell you that Elijah has already come, and they did not recognize him, but did to him whatever they pleased. So also the Son of Man will certainly suffer at their hands. And it says, and then the disciples understood that he was speaking to them of John the Baptist. Okay. So when Malachi says that John the Baptist will return, we have Jesus saying, well, that happened through John. Who did I say? Did I say Elijah? Thing? That, that happened through um, John the Baptist. And this is, a, this is an interpretive skill, is that we always let the New Testament interpret what the Old Testament says, what the Old Testament means. So Jesus says, Elijah, uh, John the Baptist was the manifestation of Elijah, then that's, then that's what Malachi meant. Even though we, we don't understand, you know, those kinds of, um, you know, those kinds of things. You know, when, uh, when, uh, What's his name? Abraham was promised the land when they went through it. Everybody thought that meant the land that God had given them, you know, which is that sliver of land 
over in the Middle East. But Paul says, I want to say in Romans 4, I might be wrong, but I think it's in Romans 4, he talked about what it meant. It meant the whole world. You know, so it's not just the Jews that God had promised Abraham, you know, where you have seeds, uh, you know, uh, grains of the number of people be the grains of sand and all that. Paul says, no, he was talking about the whole world. Like that, which in the whole world includes all the all the people, not just you know, not just uh, you know, not just the Jews. And then it says, then the disciples understood that he was speaking to them of John the, you know, John the Baptist. I don't know how how they understood that, you know, but it's like, oh, now we get it, you know, like that. And I don't know if they did, you know. A lot of times, you know, I think that they just say. You know, what's, what's the, the, you know, what's, what's the right, you know, what's, what's the right, right answer, answer, you know, that's um, in there. So now here's the, let me see. You know, I've got, um, on your page two, I've got compare, and this you can take home and study yourself. It makes for a good study. It really does. You got to read something during the week, right? Like that. But I got compare Moses on Mount Sinai, Exodus 24, to Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. I take it out of Mark 9. Uh, it mounts. It says both events are situated on high mountains, the Mount of Mount Sinai, and the high mountain in northern Israel, which is uh, you know where the Transfiguration took. Moses. Both events involve Moses, and more specifically, they involve God speaking to Moses. Yeah. Remember, Jesus is speaking as if he's God. It says the glory cloud. Both events reveal the glory of God um, in the form of a of a cloud. Even before the the cloud was like I said the cloud on wheels, but Mount Sinai was covered with a great cloud when God made his presence to um you know, to Moses, six days. Here's the thing last week, I, a couple of weeks ago. I mentioned that Matthew and Mark said, after and after six days, and it's like, well, what are the six days? Like, yeah. Because Luke says about eight days later. You know, and you got this, you know, you got this conflict. So I looked, I looked into it further. And, um, you know, the thing is, is that when Moses, when Moses and... Um, Joshua, go up to Mount Sinai in, in Exodus 24. This is something I, I never realized before. When you read the text, you go, oh, somebody added that to my Bible. It says that they waited up there six days before God spoke to them. Yeah. Now you got here in Matthew it's saying, and after six days, and this is where God's going to. You know, God's God going to speak to them. The thing with Luke's eight days, um, and I think I said this a couple of weeks ago, this is more on a spiritual angle that the eighth day represents a new beginning. You know, you know, Jesus, um, when he when he was uh, presented at the temple and circumcised on the eighth day, there's a new beginning there. You know, uh, many baptismal fonts. I don't know what ours has, but have eight sides because the baptism is a new beginning, you know. So I think that's what's, you know, probably happening. But anyway, the six days uh, relates to the Exodus 24. A voice, both divine encounters include God speaking from the cloud. Um, the system, I already mentioned this, and uh, both the accounts, and that's number six, I think, on your list. Both events place the leading man uh, you know, within the system, you know, Moses ascended the mountain with Joshua, and that Jesus ascends with Peter, James, and John. The tabernacle, both events lead to a discussion about a dwelling place for God, you know, and that's where God in Exodus gives them the plans for the uh, tabernacle, and where Peter attempts to build a dwelling place for Jesus. And then the people, I thought this was good. Is that, is that when they, they come, come down, both of them come down from the mountain. When Moses comes down from the mountain, what are the people doing? Anybody remember? Who? No, no. When Moses came down from the mountain, 
Huh? They were celebrating. Yeah, but they were worshiping the golden calf. They were having a party around the golden calf. When, when Jesus and the disciples came down from the mountain, what was happening? Well, that was one. That was one account. You know, like you said, you got to get to the three accounts. But yeah, that was one account. That comes down to where there's chaos down there. That one, they can't heal the guy. But the other account says that uh, they, he found the disciples arguing with the scribes. You know, so in both accounts, they come off the mountain, and they, you know, you have this godly experience happening up here. And then down on man's level, yeah, down on earth, you have chaos. And that's what we have, and that's what we've been studying in the book of Revelation that the master is men, is that it keeps going back and forth. You have all this stuff happening on earth, all this destruction and people doing things to each other, and then it breaks off and it's kind of like it says, but in heaven, and then you have a scene of heaven, you know, and the four living beasts and the cherubim and you know, all, all the bright the lights, lights and all that, and, and then it goes, goes back, back down onto earth, earth, and you got all this, you know, stuff and happening, and, and then it comes back. back. But in and heaven, heaven, and that's, that's the way we live. We live we in a, a um, life's, life's hard. hard. Anybody here yeah. not experienced yeah. life hard yet? You know, if you haven't, you will. I got life's hard. I got, but in heaven, you know, and that's what I think Pastor mentioned today when he said that, you know, we quoted that Matthew verse where it says, you know, to follow me, my, you know, my yoke is light and whatever, however that verse goes, you know, like that. My burden is light and my yoke is easy or vice versa. When we remember who God is, it's easier, right? right. That was one of the things that was presented in one of the things that I was listening to was the fact that that might have been one of the reasons that Peter wanted to build a shelter so he could stay up there. Yeah, he didn't want to come down to the mountain. Well, that could be. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that could, could be. be. I mean, it, it doesn't, doesn't say, say, you know, but it, uh, it, it could be. It could be that you get comfortable, comfortable, you know, in that sense. And, and, and it could be, you know, to, to, to try to take it to a practical level. It could be that we get in the presence of God and we don't want to go down and share that presence of God with other. I got mine. You know, I got mine. I don't, I don't know about the rest of you, you know, but I've got mine. And that Jesus always is saying, you got to go. You got to go. You got to go. So, any questions? That's the transfiguration. And it was to give the people, uh, the, uh, the witnesses, you know, being the disciples, a glimpse of God, a glimpse of the heavenly things. This is all in the midst of... I'm heading towards um, you know, Jerusalem. You know, I saw that here in a second, Harold. I saw it last week when I said, um, Jesus says in Luke 951, this is after they've come down from that glory and that. And he says, When the day is drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. Yeah, it's at that point. Okay, we've had our talk. You've seen a glimpse of heaven. He goes, we're going to Jerusalem. And there's only one reason for him to go to Jerusalem. It's because he's, he knows what awaits him. Isaiah 50 says, speaking of Jesus, says, but the Lord God helped me. But the Lord God helps me. Therefore, I have not been disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like a flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. Yeah. Is that, 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 that we're at that point? That's, that's why I'm stopping the study on life of Christ now, because the rest is about the crucifixion, what leads up to the crucifixion. I think this passage of eternal space to Jerusalem is the big thing. And I think that the thing, you know, everybody always wants to say that um, Palm Sunday. The beginning of Holy Week is what leads up to the crucifixion. But I think that it's the raising of Lazarus, you know, right before entering the city when he's with Mary and Martha. And he's been dead for four days and he surely he stinketh, you know, that the raising of Lazarus is what got the crowds all excited. 
Is there there's somebody, somebody raising, raising a, a, a beloved person, person back, back to life? Home. So they're the ones waving the palm branches when he comes in. But who's mad about that? The scribes and the Pharisees. They don't want somebody drawing crowds like that. Okay. But we'll get into that in January. In the meantime, we'll do the Jewish holidays, okay? Anybody have objectives to do in the Jewish holidays? Okay. We are coming, you know, Jewish holidays are broken down into two sections. There's seven official feasts. I think we, I've got ten. But I mean, there's seven, but the first four are the spring holidays of Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, Pentecost. And then the, the other three are the fall festivals and feasts. And that's where we are right now. Because even though Rosh Hashanah is not a, a you know, New Year's isn't an official one, but right after that comes the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. And then comes something else, Sukkot, I think. The, you know, the, the the temple or the the booths, you know, like that. So you've got, you know, you've got these. Then we're just so we're just getting into the fall, you know, um, the fall things. If we got nothing else, I guess we could do. Oh, go ahead. One presentation that I just assumed was the 